السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته عبد الله كيف صحة؟ كيف الأخبار؟ والله بخير الحمد لله حياكم الله شرفتونا إن شاء الله الصوت واضح؟ لا الصوت كويس كويس في شوية صدى بس بس واضح إن شاء الله نشوف السكرين شيرنج اتاكد انه شغال 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 بس اذا بدك تعمل شو مود نشوف نتاكد انه شغال كويس لا راح سلاش سوب ايوه ممتاز لا تمام اي تمام We don't mind the doctor Abdullah will, will give us you know, three, four more, three or four minutes until the attendees join. Then we get started. No problem. No problem. Okay, are we good to go, Doctor Abdullah? Yes, I'm okay to go. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the weekly EA webinar series at KFUPM. Uh, and today we have a special guest on a, going to present to us a special topic. And uh, before I start by introducing our guest speaker. I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, the EE department uh, represented by Dr. Zaiduri, and also the KICS office for their logistical support. And we also thank all our, of our uh, attendees for coming and uh, uh, joining us in this exciting webinar. 
So our speaker today is Dr. Abdullah Al-Khaldi. Dr. Abdullah Al-Khaldi is, is an assistant professor in electronics and nanoscale engineering at the University of Glasgow. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree, his master's and PhD from the University of Glasgow in 2010, 2011, and 2015, respectively. His main research interest is in compound semiconductors, including terahertz resonant tunneling diodes and gallium nitride transistor technologies. It's our great pleasure to have you, Dr. Abdullah, with us today. And we're really looking forward to this exciting presentation. So I leave you with a presentation titled Compound Semiconductor Technologies for Emerging Applications. Dr. Abdullah, the floor is all yours. Uh, th thank you very much for the introduction and also for inviting me to present this uh, talk. So today I'm going to uh, give an overview on our activities in compound semiconductors for uh, various applications. So uh, I will start with a brief introduction to introduce the University of Glasgow and also our uh, research facilities, uh, including the James Watt Nanofabrication Center and also our characterization facilities. Uh, then I will go over uh, gallium nitride uh, technologies. So basically high electron mobility transistors for RF applications. And I will end with the uh, terahertz uh, oscillators so we use for that a device called resonant tunneling diode. So I will explain more about it in the coming slides. So the University of Glasgow was founded in 1451, and it is home to several famous scientists, including James Watt, Robert Serling, and Lord Kelvin. We have about 28,000 undergraduate students and also postgraduate students. Uh, we are ranked 86th in the Times Higher Education and also 73rd in the QS World University uh, ranking. Uh, we have about 8,000 staff, including 3,400 research and teaching staff. Also, we have an annual income of around 80 million pounds, and we have several no uh, seven Nobel laureates. So here we, you see a picture of our nanofabrication facility. It's called the James Watt Nanofabrication Center. And uh, it has a total area of uh, 1450 square meters, with the class 10 to class 1000 clean room, uh, with about 25 uh, technical staff, 200 researchers, and a grant portfolio of 55 million uh, pounds. Uh, also, we have commercial access to the clean room uh, through a company called Kelvin Man Technology. Uh, the, the nanofabrication center uh, houses lots of different tools. So we have e-beam lithography and also nano e-beam lithography. Uh, we have a, a custom-made cluster which has a reactive ion etching tool with the PCBD deposition tool and also atomic layer deposition tool. So they all have uh, three chambers that are connected in situ each other so we can do the three processes uh, in situ without uh, losing vacuum. We also have non imprint uh, lithography, uh, 14 dry edge tools, uh, six metal deposition tools, uh, five electron microscopes, and also we have several uh, metrology tools, including atomic force uh, microscopy. Uh, in the center, we cover lots of uh, different uh, research activities, including uh, mimics for uh, defense, uh, medical application, healthcare, uh, energy, so photovoltaic cells. Uh, we also have lots of uh, biology activities. And, uh, we also have, uh, so this is a lab on film uh, project that we had before. Uh, also, we have a lot of activity on uh, quantum cascade uh, lasers. In terms of uh, electrical and optical measurements, so we have two terahertz characterization uh, labs. One is the millimeter wave and terahertz electronics uh, lab with uh, vector network analyzers covering up to 1.1 terahertz. So in the left uh, bottom side, you see uh, probe uh, probes. So this is connected to a probe station. And this covers uh, on wafer measurements from DC up to 325 gigahertz. We also have an ethionic chamber, which uh, goes up to 20 gigahertz. 
Uh, in the terahertz optics uh, lab, we have a, a 2.4 terahertz uh, laser and also a, an FTIR characterization uh, tool that goes up to 10 uh, terahertz. Uh, finally, we have a temperature control uh, setup. So this setup, we have uh, four DC ports connected to a B1505. So we can do uh, DC measurements plus RF measurements up to 40 gigahertz. And the temperature control uh, between 77 Kelvin to 675 uh, Kelvin. So that's about minus 200 degrees to plus 400 uh, degrees. And this is where we have the uh, pump station and the temperature control. So I think that's uh, an overview of uh, the characterization uh, tools. So I'll start now with uh, the, our activity on gallium nitride uh, transistors. So we have uh, a few projects on gallium nitride high electron mobility uh, transistors. And uh, the, the motivation is that gallium nitride covers lots of uh, different applications, including uh, automotive. Uh, we have uh, mimics. Uh, we have some uh, power electronics activities as well, or applications uh, for also space, uh, high temperature. So it is useful to have, uh, or gallium nitride is suitable to be placed in near uh, hot airplane engines and also in the oil and gas industry. Other applications including uh, LEDs and also radar applications. So why gallium nitride? Uh, here we see a figure which shows in the x-axis the frequency versus the power. And uh, below a frequency of 3 gigahertz, we have lots of uh, competing technologies, including the silicon carbide and the silicon. But once we go beyond uh, 3 gigahertz, obviously we need uh, higher mobility. And uh, there is only gallium nitride and also gallium oxalide that provides such uh, frequencies. So the main contender beyond three gigahertz is, is, is gallium nitride and gallium arsenide. And the, the advantage of gallium nitride compared to gallium arsenide is the higher uh, current density that we get out of the devices. The highest uh, frequency reported for gallium nitride is uh, FC of 342 gigahertz and Fmax of four, uh, 518 uh, gigahertz. Uh, operation temperature has been demonstrated up to uh, 1,000 degrees. Uh, here we look at a comparison of uh, gallium nitride compared to uh, silicon diamond and silicon carbide. So we have uh, several properties. Uh, one of the main advantages of gallium nitride is the high breakdown electric field. So obviously, so this means that we can apply much higher voltage as compared to silicon. So the theoretical breakdown of gallium nitride is 10 times higher than the breakdown of uh, silicon. So we can operate it at much higher voltages. Uh, here we look at a uh, basic uh, structure of uh, gallium nitride. So we start with a substrate. We have lots of options here. So we use either silicon carbide or silicon or sapphire. Uh, recently, gallium nitride substrates have uh, started to become available in larger di uh, diameters, but they are still uh, at least 10 times more expensive as compared to sapphire substrates. Uh, then we have the transition layers to relieve the strain in the structure. Uh, we have a GAN channel. And the principle of operation is that if we have a GAN, so that means we have a band gap of 3.4 electron volts, and then we put on top of it an ALGAN layer. So that means we go higher to, let's say, four, four electron volts or higher. Then we create this well in the, in the band diagram. We can see this. So this is the ALGAN or aluminum nitride. And here we have the GAN. So basically, we can create this well. And that means we have a two dimensional electron gas channel here at the interface between the GAN and the ALGAN. So the main reason that this happens is the difference in, in the band gap. So the higher the aluminum content, the higher we go. That means we are approaching the aluminum nitride band gap and that is 6.2. So if we use aluminum nitride here, 
then we get the highest uh, current density in the channel. And we can see that in, in, in the bad diagram at the, at the bottom. Uh, here we have uh, a conventional GAN based uh, structures. So, so, two structures this is algan based, and this is aluminum nitride uh, based. So the barrier here is uh, typically 25% aluminum, and then uh, we have the, uh, the, the pure GAN channel. Uh, in this case, instead of uh, algan, we are using aluminum nitride. So this is basically 100% aluminum content. Uh, this means that we can go much thinner in the uh, barrier thickness, and uh, therefore we can uh, have much higher frequency because we have uh, better control of the channel from the gate. Uh, but again, uh, growing aluminum nitride is not straightforward. And that's why up to today, uh, main commercial devices that rely on uh, algan because this is uh, challenging enough. Going to 100% aluminum content is not that uh, straightforward. Uh, another challenge with aluminum nitride, obviously, since it has higher vanguard, that means making ohmic contacts on top is more uh, difficult for the uh, electron to tunnel through the aluminum nitride. And uh, also, the higher current density in the GAN, in the two deck channel, means that we have uh, much higher thermal dissipation. So the thermal of the heat extraction becomes more uh, critical. Here we show a, a couple of uh, device layouts. So here is the gate wraparound layout. So the gate basically wraps around the drain. And that means we can uh, switch off the channel without uh, doing any visa isolation around the device. So this only requires two lithography steps. And this is very handy when you want to qualify new wafers or materials, because you can do this process in one day. In the morning, you can deposit the source and drain metallization. You can do the annealing and then deposit the gate in the afternoon. So we can quickly verify whether this is new wafer or material is working or not. At the bottom, in the bottom picture, we can see uh, ground signal ground configuration. So this is the source, one, one source here and one source at the bottom. We have the drain in the middle. So this side is the drain side, and this side is the gate side. And uh, this is the RF configuration where we can, so it, it requires uh, four lithography steps. So we have the only contacts, then the device isolation or the means isolation. So we isolate around the device. Uh, we make the gate contact later and then the bond pad. And the advantage of this layout is that we can do uh, RF measurements as well. So we can do S parameters, we can measure FTF max and so on. Uh, here is uh, an example picture of, two, of, of a 250 nanometer T gate process that we have uh, done in, uh, in, in Glasgow. So this is the overall picture. Here we can see a uh, zoomed in picture from the side of the T gate. And the left hand side, we have another T gate with a much larger uh, fin. Basically, this, could, uh, this can act as a, a field plate to ease the electric field on the drain side of the device. So we can uh, play around with EB to, to cater for our needs. Uh, here is a comparative uh, transistor characteristics. So the, the left hand side, we have the algan barrier based uh, transistors. On the right hand side, we have the aluminum nitride based transistors. And we can see the main difference is in the current density. So here, in the case of algan, we have a current density of about 1.1 amps per millimeter. Uh, here we have about 1.9 amps per millimeter, so almost uh, almost double the current density, slightly less because of uh, heating. But uh, yes, this just shows that uh, in, in the case of algan, with a 20 nanometer barrier, we can get up to 1.1 amps per millimeter. Uh, here, just with a three nanometer barrier, we can get much higher current density, and we have uh, better control over the uh, the channel. So here you can see that in the aluminum nitride case, we have a, a GM or transconductance of uh, slightly higher than 300 millisieverts per millimeter. 
while in the Algar, we have almost half of that number. So just you know, around 160 millisiemens per millimeter. And as you know, the transconductance will uh, will uh, have a, a direct impact on the F, uh, the, the maximum frequency of operation. In this study, we look at different uh, substrates. So as I mentioned, we can use, or we can draw gallium nitride on either sapphire, uh, silicon, or uh, silicon carbide. In terms of uh, thermal conductivity, silicon carbide has the highest thermal conductivity of 400 watts per meter Kelvin. Uh, silicon has a moderate uh, thermal conductivity, while sapphire has the least thermal conductivity. And we can see here from the graphs that uh, gallon sapphire, we will get about 220 milliamps per millimeter in this uh, configuration. And we can see the cell heating. So once we reach saturation, the current will start to drop. Uh, on silicon, we get slightly higher current density of 275 uh, milliamps per millimeter. Uh, while for uh, gallon silicon carbide, as we expect, we get the highest uh, current density of 325 uh, milliamps per millimeter. Uh, the other advantage of, uh, of difference between the wafers is not only the thermal conductivity, uh, but also the lattice mismatch. So uh, silicon carbide has a lattice mismatch to GAN of 3.1%, while we have uh, about 11% for uh, sapphire with GAN. Uh, silicon is the worst, so it has 17% lattice mismatch between GAN and silicon. And that means we have to have a much thicker transition layers in order to ease the mismatch before we start growing the GAN channel. So typically on silicon carbide, you can uh, grow one, one micron of, uh, of uh, GAN buffer before you start growing the channel. Uh, while on the silicon, typically you can go up to five microns or between three and five microns before you start growing your actual structure. So this, this is more demanding in terms of uh, the growth. Uh, here is an image of a fabricated uh, device. So this is a uh, GAN on the silicon carbide. And uh, we have the RF layout uh, configuration. Actually, this was done with a 50 nanometer T gate. So we used four lithography steps. And we get an FT of about 87 gigahertz and F max of 110 uh, gigahertz. Uh, so this is uh, using a 50 nanometer uh, T gate. Uh, so this shows the superior uh, performance of uh, aluminum nitride uh, or barriers of gallium nitride channels. Uh, so in, in, this, in this layout, we have two fingers. Then if we want to go to uh, multi-fingers, so here we use 10 fingers. And we, so, so this is just to increase the, uh, the actual current in the device. So here we use uh, lots of uh, air bridges to connect the sources uh, together. And you can see a lateral or a side view of the air bridges in this slide or in this picture. Uh, this, is, this was done using an aluminum algal based barrier. So obviously the frequency will be lower. And, and again, since we have a much larger device size, the total capacitance will be higher. Uh, in this case, we have an FT and Fmax of uh, 22 and 28 gigahertz respectively. Uh, the gate length here is worth to mention that it was half a micron, not 50 nanometer. So this is a much larger uh, gate length. Typically, we get uh, contact resistance between 0.4 and 0.6 ohms millimeter for this uh, kind of uh, material system. Uh, obviously, there are techniques to reduce the contact resistance if we use uh, regrowth technique or uh, doping. But uh, yeah, so this is another option. So this is the last slide regarding uh, gallium nitride. I would like to uh, show some uh, slides on the resonant thermic uh, diodes. So basically, uh, resonant thermic diodes are uh, very high frequency devices, and we can generate terahertz signals with that. And the motivation be behind going for uh, terahertz is, uh, is uh, that we require lots of uh, bandwidth, especially with the forthcoming technologies like 6G and probably 7G in the future. So we can't keep relying on three gigahertz uh, carriers. 
So terahertz is very uh, interest, interesting for uh, fixed wireless access for data center applications for intra chip uh, wireless communication. So, for example, in the data center today, we have lots of cabling between the servers. Uh, that means uh, we have lots of uh, cabling costs, especially for copper. And also we have, uh, so the airflow within the data center is restricted. Uh, that means we have to, uh, the, the power requirement just to cool down the data center is very huge. Uh, if we replace these cables with uh, wireless links, uh, that means the airflow will be much better inside the data center. And uh, that will reduce the power uh, or energy consumption requirement within the data center. Another advantage is that we can reconfigure the server as much easier if we don't have these uh, cables, since each server will have its own uh, wireless link. So the reconfiguration will be much uh, easier. So at the moment, data centers are the cable jungles. Uh, here we look at uh, state of the art uh, terahertz uh, sources. So typically, uh, between uh, megahertz and up to 300 gigahertz, we have lots of uh, options, including impact, uh, gun diode, HBTs, HEMS, CMOS. So these technologies uh, can cover up to roughly 300 gigahertz. Then if we want to go to uh, several terahertz, we can go for quantum cascade lasers and other optical sources. So this will cover the range between one terahertz and uh, beyond 10 terahertz. Uh, as you can see, we have a gap here between 300 and uh, one terahertz. And this is covered by the resonant tunneling diode. So this is the motivation behind working with this technology that it can reach. It's the only electronic device that can reach uh, beyond one terahertz. So this can go up to two terahertz, has been demonstrated recently by our, by our colleagues or uh, collaborators in Japan. So they have demonstrated up to two terahertz using a single diode. So this is a very simple technology to use. We don't need to go for a very high node fabrication process. And it covers the gap between the low frequency or the sub 300 gigahertz electronics and the photonics beyond the two terahertz. So actually, what is a resonant tunneling diode? So it's, it was first demonstrated back in uh, 1973. It has a vertical stack, so it's a vertical uh, structure. Uh, we have lots of different uh, options for material systems, but at the moment, the fastest is indium phosphide based. So we have indium phosphide substrate. Then we have a stack of layers of uh, indium gallium arsenide with different doping levels. And then we have two barriers. So these are aluminum arsenide. So we have one barrier here, one barrier there. And we have an ingas quantum well. And basically what happens because of uh, these uh, two barriers, if we look at the current voltage characteristics, as we push the voltage higher, uh, we get the typical IV behavior. So the current will increase, but at a certain point, which we call the peak voltage, uh, the current will, will start to drop. So we call this the negative differential conductance region. So in this region, the resistance is negative. It's not consuming power, it's actually supplied power. And that means in this region, we can generate an, an AC output. Uh, due to the, uh, the ability to control the capacitance, we can actually generate very high frequency uh, signals just using this negative differential conductance or negative differential resistance uh, region. And the power, the output power of this signal is determined by the difference between, uh, so the lateral difference between the V peak and V valley, the valley voltage and the peak voltage, and also the currents. So the amount of current here and uh, here at the peak and valley, if we extend this region, to a higher value and also the voltage difference to a much higher value, then we can generate higher power. So that, that depends on the selection of the layers in this uh, structure. So this is the main research activity is to control the thicknesses and also the, uh, the, the doping in these layers in order to extend this region to be able to generate much higher powers. Uh, another uh, nice thing about this uh, material 
of this device is that if we insert some light absorption layers in the middle, so just above or below the barriers, we can actually optically uh, modulate this uh, structure. And I will talk about it uh, in the next few slides. So we can actually have a photo detector uh, using this kind of uh, device. <clears throat> Uh, here to the left hand side, we can see an all electronic uh, RTD. Uh, in the right hand side, we see an opto electronic uh, RTD. So, as I mentioned before, here we can actually uh, bias the device uh, in the NDR region or in the NDC region, and then we can insert or input a data signal. So, this data signal will, will modulate the, the output. So, basically, these zeros and ones. Once we, uh, we we modulate this uh, device with the with the input data, so we can generate an output terahertz wave that carries some data. Uh, in the optical in the optical case, uh, we again bias the device here, uh, but we have an input optical signal, so we can optically modulate the RTD. So these are two ways of uh, doing that: either fully electronic, or also using optoelectronics. Uh, here is a is a, an example structure that we use in the Glasgow. We actually use this one to generate the highest uh, power reported to date using a single device. So this is an indium phosphide substrate. Here we have a stack of uh, ingas layers. What is important is the heart of the RTD. So these two yellow layers, which are the barriers. So we have 1.4 nanometer aluminium barriers in each side. Uh, we have a quantum well of 4.5 nanometer thickness, and this is this was chosen carefully in order to get the best compromise between the power. So, as I mentioned, the power is determined by this region here, and also frequency. So, we need to be careful about the capacitor, uh, the capacitance that will determine the frequency, and also the uh, power, which is determined by the IV characteristics, and the contacts are. Uh, highly doped uh, in gas layers in 3 to the 19. Uh, so these are silicon doped. In, in, uh, in this figure, we want to show that we can control the, uh, the negative differential resistance region, so basically the power using uh, the device sizing. So here we have a 3 by 3 uh, micron square device, so that's 9 micron squares. Here we have 5 by 5, so that's a total of 25 micron square size. And with the device sizing, obviously, uh, the, the larger the device size, we get higher power, but then we reduce the frequency. So we will have a lower uh, FX. So we have to find that sweet spot between frequency and power. Uh, to the left hand side here, we see a picture of uh, a schematic of the circuit design. So here we have the device or the diode. Uh, we have the load or output at this side. And uh, the basic design principle is that uh, it's, a, it's a simple LC circuit. So we have the, the inductance and we have the subcapacitance of the device. So these two will resonate with each other. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, once we select the size, let's say five by five, uh, we know how much capacitance we have. And then based on the frequency that we require, we will design the L to provide that frequency. So this L will, will be designed with, uh, based on the capacitance of this. Then we have a shorting uh, capacitance here, T, so that will short the RF signal. So it will go like, like this way. And then we have uh, a resistor just for st stabilization. And these are the parasitics that come with the biasing cable. So LB and RB refer to the bias cable uh, inductance and resistance. Uh, we have the bias voltage here and we have RL. And if we look here, so the bias voltage, so this one, it comes from the, the left hand side. So this is the DC bias port. We have the uh, RE, so this RE for stabilizing the, resist uh, the diode. So basically, this RE will short any low frequency signal that comes from this uh, cable. So we have a short circuit here for any low frequency RF signal. We have CE, which is the shorting capacitor. So this is an, an MIL capacitor. Uh, then we have the inductor here, L. So this L is the inductor. It's basically a microstrip uh, line. 
uh, based on the length of this line, we can determine how much inductance we need. We have the RTD here, so it's that small spot in the middle. And then we have the RF output here. And we just put uh, the, a small capacitor just for protecting the, uh, the, the spectralizer. Uh, with this circuit, we can generate uh, 260 uh, gigahertz using uh, 25 micron square device. Uh, also by uh, changing, so here we use the 65 micron uh, long micro strip line. Uh, here we have uh, 312 gigahertz RTD oscillator. We use the 88 uh, micro, uh, micro uh, micro strip inductor. So obviously you might think why this is longer than that, but because this one has a, a much larger device size compared to that one. So here we use uh, 16 micron square size for the device. So we just need to balance the capacitance of the RTD with the length of the, of the inductor. Here is a picture of, uh, so this picture is basically the fabricated uh, device using this design. And uh, here we have the DC port, we have the RF port, and we get about one milliwatt of output at 260 uh, gigahertz. And this is a picture of our uh, setup. So basically we have the probe station, we have the, uh, the Ericsson VDI uh, PM5 power meter, and we measure the power directly on chip from the RF port. Uh, now we will move to uh, systems. So we have here a demonstrator using our uh, resonant energy diodes. So this is a wireless communication uh, setup. In the right hand side, we have our chip uh, on wafer. We have a horn antenna. So this is a commercial 300 gigahertz horn antenna. We have two lenses just to collimate the beam. So this is a 300 gigahertz uh, wireless link. At the receiver side, we have a short barrier diode and some uh, low noise amplifiers. So you can see the schematic here. So we have the DC power supply, we have the data generator. We use a bias T to combine the DC power supply with this RF data uh, into the RTD. Then the RTD will generate the 300 uh, gigahertz signal, uh, which is modulated uh, with the data that's coming from the data generator. At the receiver side, basically we have a short barrier diode. So this is an envelope detector that will filter out the carrier. The, we will just have the data coming through to the low noise amplifier to the oscilloscope. And on the oscilloscope, we can see uh, these data rates, so one gigabit per second. Uh, here up to 12 gigabits uh, per second. This was the uh, limit for the data generator. Uh, so we can see at 300 uh, gigahertz, we have a decent distance of about one meter, and we can get uh, some very high data rates. Here in collaboration with the IMN in Lille, we did a demonstration of a much uh, longer distance. So this was uh, 20 meters. So we have two lenses here, one for the source, one for the detector, and we could see data rates of uh, two gigabits per second. And then at six gigabits per second, the eyes will start to uh, close. Uh, here is a short uh, video. Let me just uh, turn this. So in this video, you will see a laptop here, which is transmitting the uh, data or a video at 1080p. So if we use 30 frames, we will have 1.5 gigabits per second. Uh, for 60 frames, we will have 3 gigabits per second. So this is an HD uh, video transmission. So this laptop will, co will connect to an HDMI uh, cable that will go into the RTD. Uh, then from the other side, we will have the receiver, and we can see the video coming here wirelessly.
So in this side, the, the data is coming to the RTD. The RTD is on chip. We have the horn antenna from the source side. We have the two lenses, and this is the commercial shot variant diode, which is the receiver. And this is a 300 gigahertz carrier. Okay, uh, so here just a few more slides. So we have uh, here have demonstrated a 75 uh, gigahertz uh, source. And we put it in the waveguide package. So here we have the source. Here we have the detector. And again, we could see some uh, data. So this was roughly four gigabit per second. So the motivation here was to have high gain. So packaging the device in waveguide we think it might be a better solution compared to uh, on-chip antennas. Uh, the photo detector, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if we insert some uh, photo detector, uh, photo sensitive layers, we can have a photo detector, a photo detection capability within the RTD. So basically uh, the black line is the uh, bias in darkness. Uh, if we, uh, if we uh, insert some light or shine light onto the RTD, then we can shift the bias uh, to the left-hand side. So we can see the red curve here. So we can shift back and forth by switching on and off the light. And this is how we can uh, activate or modulate the RTD. Uh, this is a measure uh, data. So this is the RTD chip. We have the fiber coming from the top, and then we have the DC. So the DC in darkness, we can see the blue line or the blue curve. If we apply 0.1 milliwatt of optical power, we can see we have a DC responsivity of three amps per watt. If we shine one milliwatt of optical power, we can shift this further. So we can control how much shift we need. Obviously the DC responsivity will, uh, will go down a little bit, but that's uh, okay. Uh, this was actually done in the University of uh, Lisbon, our uh, collaborator. Uh, here is an image of a fabricated uh, photo detector. So again, this is the visa of the RTD. The only difference between this and the electrical one is that here we have an optical window. So basically we leave the metal, we have an opening within the metal. So we can see the semiconductor. We can shine light from the top. And then this is the bottom visa here, and these are the bottom pads. And uh, here we can see, again, we can control the uh, device size to control the ID characteristics and the current uh, level. Uh, the difference between this and the electrical is these two layers, so layer number three and number nine. So the conventional one will only have uh, these layers, but here we have uh, 500 nanometer of uh, thick optical, uh, optically sensitive layers. So the light absorption will happen in these layers. And again, we can control the composition and the doping in order to maximize the light absorption. Uh, for, for these ones, we, uh, we demonstrate uh, very high powers, so uh, 35 milliwatt of power uh, at 11 gigahertz, and uh, 10 milliwatt of power using at 49 gigahertz. Uh, these are large size devices uh, to allow for the optical window, so we can have some uh, optical injection. Uh, here is another example, so we have uh, optical fiber coming uh, from the top. Uh, we have the DC probe here. Uh, we can see a top view picture uh, here. So actually this is the RF probe. We have the optical fiber coming on top of the device. Uh, this is the setup. So we have a data generator, uh, fault generator. We have a laser diode. So we try 1310 and also 1550 uh, nanometers. Uh, then we shine the light from the top. Uh, we have the DC probe. And on the other side, we have the RF probe to see uh, the, the eye diagrams on the oscilloscope. Uh, this is how they look. So we have 100 megabits. So these are optical, optically generated uh, data or eye diagrams. So we have 100 megabits up to 750, and then the eyes will start to close at uh, one gigabits per second. 
So this is just to show that we can do electrical modulation and also optical modulation. Uh, finally, I'll just present a couple of slides on neuromorphic computing. So using this uh, optically uh, modulated uh, RTDs, uh, we, had, uh, we had recently a chip AI project. It's a European project. Uh, the motivation was to do uh, neuromorphic computing the chip. So here the idea is that we have the electronics, uh, we have the uh, photodiodes, and here we have we do the we do the computation in the optical domain. So basically, we have lasers and the photodiodes. So we come we come from electronics to the optical domain, and the goal is to achieve uh, ten femtojoules per bit energy efficiency. Uh, here is another illustration of uh, so so basically we have uh, nano pillars, and we can uh, have an optical link between these uh, pillars. And basically, we can use the electrical uh, activation control. So we will have uh, nano lasers and nano photo detectors embedded within the RTD structure. So we can have uh, the, the processing happening in the optical domain. Uh, here is an SEM of the nano RTD devices that we made. So we can make these uh, structures with 100 nanometer diameter or 300 or 500. The shiny bit on the top is the localization. So this is the semiconductor. Uh, so basically, we form the visa first. Then we put down the, uh, the, the bottom contact. So that is the circular metalization of the inside. And finally, we put the board pad. So this is how we make our uh, nanophoto detectors. Uh, these are IV characteristics. So why, why do we go for uh, nano photo detectors? It is just to reduce the power consumption. So here we have a 300 nanometer single RTD that will only uh, require 35 micro amps of uh, current. And the bias voltage is uh, just about 0.6 volts. So here you can see that the power consumption is very, very low. Uh, here is another example. So we can uh, control the, uh, the uh, the current with the device size. So here we have 300 nanometers. Here we have 500 nanometers. And if we stack multiple RTDs with each other, like here we have nine nano wires of 500, we can increase the current to 800. But obviously, here it's a compromise between power consumption and light absorption. So the smaller the device, the, the smaller the light absorption, but also the lower the power consumption. Uh, this is the last uh, slide. So here, just to show you the uh, fabricated RTD device. So on the, uh, in the top, uh, in the right hand side, uh, we demonstrate the uh, set setup. So we have an oscilloscope, we have a bias T, we have a bias voltage, uh, we have the RTDs, and with that we generate uh, spikes at uh, 200 megahertz. Uh, using the RTDs that we have shown uh, earlier. So I think, so, so, so the, main, uh, the main objective is basically to uh, generate the spikes either optically or electrically uh, and use those to make some uh, calculations using very low energy. So finally, we have covered the gallium nitride uh, Hertz for RF applications. Also, we have demonstrated some RTD oscillators up to 300 gigahertz in the J band. Uh, we have done wireless transmission with over 10 gigabits per second data rate, over a range of uh, actually up to 20 meters. And uh, we can achieve the, the, a big range beyond 10 meters using high gain cables. So finally, we thank our funders, and thank you very much. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. Very exciting presentation. We thank you very much for sharing your work with us and uh, for going through this uh, insightful and, and informative presentation. So now we have uh, some time for questions. I think we have a good uh, five, 10 minutes. 
So we can open the floor for questions. If any of the attendees would like to ask a question, you can either type it in the chat. Now we'll be happy to read it to, the, uh, to our speaker, or you can raise your hand and speak. I see some hands raised already. So I see uh, Ibrahim Saeed. Please go ahead, Ibrahim. Ibrahim, you can ask. You can, you can uh, turn on your microphone and ask. Ibrahim, you can uh, un unmute yourself. Ibrahim Saeed. Okay. And Dr. Zaiduri, if you have a question, you're also welcome to ask. Okay, until our... Uh... Uh, 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 Dr. Firas, yeah. Uh, I just uh, would like to thank uh, Dr. Abdullah for this uh, good uh, and uh, uh, exciting talk. Uh, uh, I just, uh, for uh, the information, I think the chat is not working, it's disabled, so... Uh, is it? Yeah, and uh, you have to unmute. If anyone raises his hand, you can, you, you can unmute him because we, can, we cannot control as a webinar. It's not uh, like seminar. Okay, no. Yeah, so no please. Problem. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay. So, uh, Ibrahim had his hand up. If you want to speak, Ibrahim, feel free. Until then, I have a couple of questions, Dr. Abdullah, if you allow me. Very exciting presentation. Uh, would you mind going to slide number 27, where we have the structure of the RTD? Uh -huh. This one. So I was wondering, uh, Dr. Abdullah, can you comment on these uh, multiple layers? Are these for the contacts, the ones above the RTD and below? Are these for omic contacts or do they have a different purpose? Yeah, so let me just put my marker. Yes. So, uh, so, this, so, so this yellow layer are the barriers, but then the ones uh, on top of that, are the spacer layers, we call them spacer layers. Spacer layers. So that's why uh, we have uh, graded doping. So we start with two to the 16, uh, two to the 18, and then we end up with the contact. So the contact is just the green layers, this one and that one. Uh -huh. yeah. And what's their purpose with these spacing layers? So the spacing layers will create this uh, uh, delta V, so 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 for uh, what do you call it the uh, DC effect. Yes, uh, I'm just trying to remember the term. So, so basically, the, the the spacer layers. If you have uh, so for this highly doped layer, uh, they will provide the electrons for the contact. Uh, these ones, you want to deplete them. Well, now I want to talk about the depletion. So when you apply a very high electric field, you want to deplete, fully deplete those regions. And that will create this uh, delta V. So uh, if you have very large uh, spacer layer, you can increase your delta V, but obviously because it is uh, highly resisted, so the current will drop. The, the current level here will drop. So it, there is also always like a compromise between current and voltage. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So these are not like uh, randomly selected. They have to be very carefully uh, selected. For example, this uh, in gas 1.5 nanometer, this is uh, undoped. And the reason for that, you don't want to have any doping near the barrier because it is very thin. Um, uh, again, some people are very ambitious. And so they put, uh, they choose the 20 nanometer or 10. But then this will go to microamps because uh, this undoped layer will uh, severely affect the current density. So for growth reasons, because if you grow any doped layer directly on the 1.4 nanometers, obviously some doping will uh, will enter the barrier. And that will not. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. So for doping reasons, we 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 use that. So it's just like a buffer. Nice. But the spacers will start from here, so the 2 to the 16, 2 to the 18, so we choose that uh, carefully. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much. 
Okay, so if any one of the uh, attendees would like to uh, ask, feel free to raise your hand and uh, you may then speak by the microphone. If until we, we get another question, Dr. Abdullah, I had another question if you don't mind. Yes. You mentioned the issue of the ohmic contacts to the GAN uh, devices. Yes. Can you go to the slide? I forgot the number here. I didn't note it down. But when you showed the structure with the, the allium, aluminum uh, nitride, this one, yes. 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 So when you contact the devices, do you do it uh, through tunneling or do you actually etch some of the an, uh, aluminum nitride? Uh, well, we do both. So ideally, uh, ideally you want to remove the barrier. But the problem when you remove the barrier, you kill the two dead. Uh -huh. So that's the issue. So obviously you can uh, aim to still etch the barrier and make side contact. But you know, for lithography reasons, because you have an undercut in the resist, so you always have a side gap between the metal and the two dead. And even like a uh, hundred nanometer of gap will be very difficult to penetrate. So sometimes we etch like halfway. So the two deck will be weaker, but at least uh, you will uh, tunnel much easier. Mm. Again, because of the annealing, when you anneal at 800 degree, the metal will penetrate through anyway to, to here. Ah, okay. Yeah. So again, when the metal penetrates, probably the two deck will die, but at least you will have uh, a very good side contact between the metal and the two deck, as compared to when you etch it down and then try to some people try to do tilted evaporation for the metal in order to uh, contact the side. Uh, but again, that's not straightforward. Sometimes the yield is not very good. Yeah. So there are lots of tricks to, uh, to do this kind of thing, but uh, yeah. Eventually, most of uh, the research now uh, focus on the regrowth. So they will fully remove that and then Deposit or grow some very highly doped GAN ah. in this region. From the sides. Yeah, just for the contacts. Okay, okay interesting. Yeah. Very nice. So I've seen you 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 showed at the end the detectors, uh, but you did it with the RTDs. Yes. Have, have you looked into using the the hemp uh, the high electromobility transistors for detection? I think there's like these plasma wave detectors or... Yeah, yeah there is a, an activity uh, in, in Germany about that. So they have uh, Professor uh, Rostos. They have uh, done lots of activity on uh, uh, GAN helmets for terahertz detection. But we haven't done it in glass wave. You haven't tried the, this aluminum nitride uh, structure for uh, detection? Uh, no, no. Interesting. That's it from my side. Let's uh, let's open the floor one last time for the attendees. Uh, so if anyone has a question, you may uh, uh, raise your hand up and we can uh, unmute you so that you may ask. Okay, do we have any questions? Let me see the chat problem if I can solve that. Yeah, in the aluminum nitride case. Uh, okay, I see. Okay. Yes, yes, Dr. Abdullah, go ahead. Yeah, I would just say in the aluminum nitride case, it is easier to tell because uh, it is only three nanometer thick. But because of the much higher band gap, usually uh, we get much lower contact, uh, much higher contact resistance. Uh, in theory, it looks easier because it is thinner. But actually, even three nanometer of aluminum nitride will have a huge effect on the contact resistance. Because you are going from four electron volts to 6.2 electron volts scales. Yes. So it becomes even more important to etch the aluminium nitride yes. uh, in this material system. And that's why most commercial devices they just rely on gas. Aluminium nitride is very uh, tough to deal with. Interesting. So actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I told the, they can, the attendees to ask in the chat box. There's another box called Q&A. That's where you can send your questions. So uh, if you have a question, you can type it in the Q&A box. You will find it at the bottom of the, uh, the screen. Okay, there we have, okay. 
So Dr. Zaguri is thanking the speaker again. All right, so it was a great pleasure to have you, Dr. Abdullah. Very interesting work, very exciting. And uh, it relates a lot to me. When I started my PhD, I was working on terrorist detectors. Very interesting uh, topic. Uh, I can see the hardware has advanced extensively the past, uh, I think, couple of years. And uh, the results you have shown are uh, cutting edge. So I think uh, this this might open new opportunities. Maybe you can just comment with a minute or two on what do you think the impact of these new hardware terahertz uh, sources and detectors on the communication industry? Do you think? Uh, we'll see an, an impact on the 5G infrastructure, maybe 6G. Where do you see this uh, having an impact? Yeah, for sure, it will have a great impact on, the, on future wireless communications. Uh, you asked a very important uh, question regarding the 6G. This is, a, this is an open question that everybody is trying to find an answer for. So there's lots of uh, discussions, including from the regulators, but uh, most likely uh, 6G will include D-band, so about 150 gigahertz, maybe 300 gigahertz, maybe. Uh, probably it will include uh, some W-band uh, operation as well, between 75 and 110 gigahertz. So obviously with this, uh, silicon cannot really uh, provide a solution or they might provide partial solution. So I think uh, three fives are complementary to silicon. And uh, the main reason is that we can go very high in frequency, beyond 100 gigahertz with uh, decent power. Uh, so for sure, for, for, for future wireless communication, this will play a very big uh, role. We'll have to uh, move beyond the five gigahertz band to much higher frequencies. Do you see that in allium uh, and gallium nitride in GAN, or do you see this could be uh, gallium arsenide or one of the other candidates? Uh, well, gallium arsenide uh, is is the is the default solution today uh, because it is proven it can work up to uh, several hundreds of gigahertz. Uh, but the only issue with that gallium arsenide is the power. You know, the power levels only gallium nitride can provide. And I believe that uh, gallium nitride will eventually catch up. At the moment, the main the challenge is the, is the current collapse, is the reliability. Oh, yeah, so, reliability. So because you have lots of defects in the structure, because you are not growing with a native substrate, you are growing with a foreign substrate. So if you so the main the approach now is to grow GAN on silicon because it's the cheapest substrate. But it is the worst in terms of, uh, or the most challenging in terms of lattice mismatch. Mm -hmm. Because there is 17% lattice mismatch. And that creates lots of defects in the structure, which will cause uh, current collapse and early breakdown and many other issues. So work is ongoing in terms of optimizing and finding solutions to that. Interesting. Yeah. All right, so maybe we'll have some uh, opportunity to discuss offline. We do a lot of defect modeling for. Uh, multiple technologies at KPPM. So we can discuss that offline, hopefully. Yeah, for, sure, for sure. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah, for this very exciting talk. If there are no further questions. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Abdullah and the attendees for uh, attending this talk with us. And we hope to, uh, uh, inshallah, host Dr. Abdullah maybe sometime on campus in the future, inshallah. Sure, so, sure. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. And, and we look forward to more interactions in the future. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, we'll meet again for sure. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Zaidori, for your efforts. And, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdullah and Dr. Firas, for uh, moderating this, uh, this talk. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.